about uh, Chris Coster. So this was an endorsement of a Democratic uh, attorney general for governor. What is it about Chris Coster that gets the endorsement from the NRA? Well, uh, Chris Coster has a 17-year record as a prosecutor, as a senator, and as uh, the attorney general for supporting the Second Amendment rights. I mean, he's filed many uh, amicus briefs in support of the Second Amendment. He voted for uh, right to carry legislation uh, while he was a state senator, and we felt that uh, that he would best uh, serve and protect the Second Amendment rights of the Missourians out there. Uh, Eric Greitens, in his primary uh, race, ran commercials where he was, took a gun and started shooting things. So a lot of people thought that why would the NRA turn their back on such a gun-loving candidate like Eric Greitens? Well, it's not necessarily that we're turning it back on him whatsoever. I mean, what he did for for our country and serving for the Navy SEALs is, you know, I, I just can't say enough about it. But it's a standard misconception that, that we see from time to time where people think that the NRA is a partisan organization, and we're not. We're a single-issue organization, and that issue is the Second Amendment. So we don't care if they're Republican or Democrat. It's just about what, they, what we believe that the candidate will do in support of those rights. Um. Is it that Eric? Is it is it that you don't have a track record on what Eric Greitens would do? So you don't know. So you'd rather the the devil you know versus the devil you don't know. <laughs> well, I don't think that they're really devils either way. I mean, with either of these candidates, if you uh, go and look. Uh, on our website with the grading, you know, Eric also got a, a very high grade from us, I believe almost as high, if not the same as what Chris did. But uh, as I said, we've seen what, what Chris does uh, when he was in office previously. And we have confidence in the fact that he will serve uh, as governor as one who will actually help out the Second Amendment, if not actually help uh, advance those rights. Yeah. Uh as uh, it, it, the NRA endorses Chris Coster, what comes with that? Just a piece of paper saying you're endorsed? Does any money, does any volunteers, any knocking on doors, any anything else come with that? Uh, well, the, that varies per candidate. I, I don't know it's, what the details are exactly with uh, the endorsement for Coster, but, I mean, it could involve any of those. It could involve none of those. I assume that there, there will be something that goes out. Um, I just don't. I haven't been privy to that information yet. Gotcha. Uh, Lars, I've often said uh, I am not a member of the NRA, um, but I've often noted on the show, and I've gotten quite a bit of pushback from time to time, that uh, the overwhelming majority of NRA members that I know are, yes, gun-loving. Many of them are hunters, and many of them are much more environmentally friendly than the environmentally pe than the people who claim to be environmentally friendly. <laughs> yeah, we do see that a lot. It's it's uh, another misconception out there. They think just because the hunters for some reason, then they must hate the uh, the outdoors and the environment, and that's not it at all. They love that. They love being out there in the midst of everything, you know, feeling the wind and the sun, and you know a lot of times when you're out there, a heck of a lot of cold. Uh, <laughs> and with that, the the fees that they pay for the hunting licenses, the taxes that they pay on the on the game fees and all the other stuff that goes back into protecting the the environment it goes into actual conservation and paying to upkeep the lands making sure everything is maintained and the hunters are a huge part of making that possible just by taking part in that sport yeah i've also noticed that the nra is a stickler and very much a promoter of gun safety Oh, definitely, definitely. With uh, each class that we hold, you know, we have almost, I think it's 130,000 certified instructors out there teaching about a million people a year, you know, about the safe and responsible use of firearms. And uh, with that, there are the handbooks that come along with those different lesson plans. Each one has a chapter in there devoted completely and totally towards uh, the safety and storage and the whole nine yards. You know, we believe that uh, you need to be a responsible gun owner, a safe gun owner, and uh, know what you're doing if you're going to be handling a firearm, whether we're talking about sport shooting, whether we're talking about hunting, or when it comes to self-defense. What, what's on the horizon for the NRA? What's the next big issue you guys are tackling and or trying to defeat? 
Well, out there in Missouri, the big issue that we're seeing right now is uh, the override session coming up in a few weeks uh, with uh, Senate Bill 656. Uh, we're making a big push for that right now, hoping that they will override Governor Nixon's veto. You know, there's been a lot said about this because it's got a few provisions in there. The permitless carry, which a number of other states already have, haven't had any problems with it whatsoever. There's also uh, an enhancement on the stand your ground law, which means that if you're out and about, you can protect yourself if you're forced to be in that sort of a situation. And we think that this is a good law, and I hope that our people are going to get out there, call their legislators, and tell them to support the override of 656. I don't understand a permitless, a permitless permit. Well, ex- explain that. Well, there's a, what they call permitless carry, or some call it constitutional carry. And what that basically means is I don't have to get a permit from the state if I'm going to carry my firearm concealed. Now, you already don't need one if you're going to be carrying open. Right. But if I put a jacket on and I got the gun on my hip, all of a sudden it's concealed. Am I suddenly more dangerous? No, of course not. And, you know, the, we've heard the other side talk about, oh, now dangerous people are going to be able to go out and get, carry firearms. And that's, that's not what happens. This 656 does not allow anyone to handle a firearm that wasn't previously allowed to handle a firearm already. These people have already passed background checks in order to purchase the gun in the first place. And this just makes it easier for them to protect their families and home. I don't understand. So I, I, right now I can go and get a permit and then, cons- and then carry a gun and then put it in my pocket. Um, that would not change, but, um, but I could then wear it on my hip and wear a jacket over it, and that would be considered open carry? No, that would be considered concealed carry. If you're just going out there in your jeans and a T-shirt and you have it on your hip, that's open carry. Right. But if you put a jacket on, all of a sudden you're concealing the firearm, so that would be considered concealed carry. Right. Uh, now, there's a permit system that will stay in place there in Missouri if 656 passes, because if for no other reason, Missouri has reciprocity agreements with, I think it's 35 other states. And if you want to be able to carry in any of those other states, then yes, you need to go ahead and get the permit. But if you're just going to be carrying in the state, then you wouldn't. Mm-hmm. Lars uh, Dale, Dale side with us. He's a spokesman for the NRA talking about the uh, endorsement that they gave to Chris Coster, who's the attorney general who wants to be your next governor. While I have you, Lars, uh, I, I know there are many people who support the NRA but are confused over the, um, of the uh, list, the no-fly list, right? Why is it if you're on a no-fly list, will you, are you still able to buy a gun? And I know the NRA is very much on this. Explain to people why it makes sense that if you're not safe enough to fly, it's okay for you to buy a gun. Well, the first thing you have to know is that the list was sitting at about, I think it was forty to 60,000 names. Uh, back in 2006. And now their estimates from what we've heard from different testimony and stuff is somewhere between a million and a million five. Ninety-eight percent of those people are not American citizens or resident aliens, so they're not allowed to buy firearms in the first place. Second point overall is that if somebody who is on that list tries to buy purchase a firearm, The first thing that happens when their name is run through the federal database is that the FBI agent in charge of their case, he gets dinged. He's notified that this person is trying to purchase a firearm. Now they decide from there whether or not they want to let that go through or whether they want to delay the purchase. If they think that there's a problem, they can delay the purpose, set up a sting, set up surveillance, follow them back, figure out what they're doing, if they are doing anything wrong. So there's a way that they're, that's already in place that they can make sure that nobody is going to get too far with that. Now, here's the other part, though. You can be on that no-fly list if, uh, well, I'll, I'll say me. I can be on that no-fly list if my girlfriend lives in a building where they suspect there might be a terrorist living. The only reason that I'm on the list is because they might want to question me about things that I've seen. But you have to remember also this new fly list. This is a list that Senator Ted Kennedy was on. Right, I understand that. But, but but Ted Kennedy, but T- Ted Kennedy was on it uh, clearly for not the right reasons and was taken off of it. You are on it. That means you can't fly. You, you know, in the normal course of business, you're going to want to fly. That will be corrected. 
And so it, it, it sounds well, to me like the no-fly list needs to be fixed because if you're on it, because your girlfriend lives, lives in a building where there's a terrorist walks by every day, sounds to me like the list isn't very effective. Well, right, exactly. This is, that's been what the FBI has said. That's been what the ACLU has said. I mean, it's sort of strange bedfellows when you think about the NRA, the ACLU, and the FBI agreeing on a, on a certain issue. But we've all come out and said that this is uh, not a good thing to do, not a good way to use to, to police that. And I know that you hear a lot of people that are out there trying to rabble raise and say, like, of course we don't want terrorists having guns. Well, no, we don't want terrorists having guns. But terrorists aren't getting guns this way. It's just something that they're using as a hot-button issue to inflame the public. So once you sit back and you recognize what the facts are, then you realize that this isn't a problem, and this isn't a way that we should be denying you know, law-abiding American citizens of their right to keep and bear arms. Lars, uh, Dale side with us. One more uh, round of questions, if you still have a second, and that sure. is uh, Chicago has just marked their 500th homicide in Chicago this year alone. And they are saying up in Chicago that it is the influx of guns from out of state, illegal guns from out of state, that is uh, part of the reason as for the high murder rate in Chicago. What does the NRA say? Well, I think the problem that we have in Chicago is what you saw in a number of other cities across the nation, and that's the fact that they're not arresting the people who are actually breaking the law. And when they are arresting, they aren't prosecuting, at least to the fullest extent of that. The Chicago Sun-Times did a study a year or two ago that looked about that and saw that for a first-time offender, if they, had, they were in illegal possession of a gun, they could be sentenced of anywhere from one to three years. They were getting one year. The average or the, uh, the, the amount of time that you can spend in jail if you're a felon who's found in possession of a gun was three to ten years, and the average was four years. Then you throw in the good behavior and the overcrowding, and these people aren't serving any time whatsoever for actually breaking the law. So there's no incentive for them to actually not break the law. They figure, oh, I'll do a little bit of this, I'll plead something out, then it'll go away. If you go through and actually address the problem, if you enforce the laws that are actually on the book, then that will make a difference. We saw that in, Rich in uh, Richmond with Project Exile. We saw it up in Philadelphia with uh, Operation Ceasefire. Uh, they saw those murder rates drop by 30 and 40 percent in the, in the first few years of those operations, and then they discontinued them. But if you actually go after the bad guys, the ones who are breaking the law, and you arrest and prosecute them, then that will make the difference. Lars Daleside, spokesperson for the NRA. Lars, you're always welcome here. Thanks for checking in. Appreciate you having me on. You got it. The NRA endorses Chris Coster, the Democrat, over Eric Greitens, the Navy SEAL, who ran out of bullets in his commercial.